wow, that was some really good worship. And thank you, Nikki, for the beautiful prophetic word. Guys, I just wanted to ask you a question. What do we have to do to get God on our team? What do we have to do to get God fighting our battles for us? Because I don't know about you, but God would be the first person I pick on the battlefield in my team. Because I, I want the victory, right? I want to get through that battlefield, right? And we can only do that with God. And I mean, that sounds very obvious, but how many times do we go through life fighting battles without God? Trying to do things without Him. And we can't. We simply can't. If we want to obtain that victory and just simply get through that battle and be victorious, we need God on our team. And all you have to do is have faith. Have faith that God is bigger than your obstacle and bigger than any obstacle you could ever face. Have faith that God is going to bring you through it, that you don't have to give from an empty cup. God fills that cup up for you and you give from Him and He will get you through it. And have faith that God's plan is bigger than yours even when you don't understand the battlefield that you're on or why you're even there. And Deuteronomy 20 verse four says, for the Lord your God, it is he who gives you, what, who <laughs> goes with you to fight for, fight for you against your enemies, to give you the victory. So I pray that whatever battlefield you're facing right now, whether you understand it or not, I pray that God fills up your cup. I pray that he is the one that gets you through it. And now, Jakes and Rochelle will be sharing a message about expectation. Hello guys and girls, <laughs> hope you guys are good. We hope you had an awesome week, thank you so much for the worship guys, that was just very heartful worship and we are going to be sharing the preach today, something different and the first time we're going to be doing that, go team go. Hey. <laughs> and so we are, we are, Lord laid on our hearts to speak about unrealistic expectations and how we manage that. And what does it look like in our lives? Because, first of all, we have to identify certain things, right? right? To be able to know if those things are actually in our lives and if they are causing us to sin. So we are going to touch on a few areas, bring up maybe what it looks like in our lives, in my life, so that maybe you can go, ah, and identify it in your own lives. And then see if it's maybe something that's causing you sin. Um, and so in, in starting to prepare, I just really felt that um, we have been brainwashed, all of us from a young age, to think that if you do something, you get a reward, right? If you do something good, you, do, you get a reward. Even as little as the little ones in, at, in preschool, if you listen really well, teacher will give you a sticker. And then later on it would be, if you run your best and you win the race, you get a, a, a medal or a trophy. Then it goes even as far as later on in life when you are working towards a promotion. If you put in the hours, you will get promoted. But the only problem is with that is when you are having these expectations of something's going to come, it opens up space for you to be disappointed right. or hurt or bitterness to creep in. And so we're going to look at those expectations and often we, because we've had that and we've grown up with that, idea of like our brains know that this is the way that we do things we kind of put those same expectations on our families on our children on our bosses on our work colleagues and even our marriage partners um, and that's just going to open up a whole lot of um, areas that Satan will love to dig into and expand in our hearts if we don't identify them and get them out of there all right, so let's look and see. And then Jakes is going to then explain and, and shift our mindsets from expectations to something else. All right. Um, so there's four areas we're going to look at. Self-expectations, expectations we place on others, like our children, our boss, the checkout tiller, the gardener, um, marriage, the expectations we place in our marriage, and then also our expectations we place on God. So the first one, we're going to hit that first one. And the first one is our self-expectation. Now, we can be our very best, harshest critics, right? That's right. 
all the time. <laughs> um, I want you to take a moment and I want you to think of your very, the earliest memory you have, as young as you can go back, like any memory. And then I want you to think of as young as you can go back again, but on a moment where you feel like you are unworthy, where you feel you're unloved, you're ugly, um, that you're not good enough. The earliest memory of where you didn't like something about yourself. Right, and those are lies. Those are lies that have crept in. And Satan's so good at using children. Like we are sponges, you know. So we, he, if he damages a child, he's damaged you for life. Mm -hmm. And unless we identify those damages, we, we can't move on. And there's always going to be something inside of us that that we need to deal with. So I'm going to talk to you about my first, my earliest memory. I didn't even ask you when you wanted to do it. Okay. I'll, I'll ask you now. <laughs> <laughs> my earliest memory is actually triggered by smell. The smell of cooked porridge. If I smell cooked porridge, I can literally smell and see the nursery school as my mom was dropping me off at nursery school. I can picture the pictures on the wall, the whole entrance, and that feeling of insecurity, knowing that my mother's about to leave me alone in this place and I don't want to be here. So that, that cooked porridge smile really doesn't sit well with me. It's not a nice memory. But the earliest memory that I have of when I, I felt unworthy or I, um, just not good enough, it, surprisingly, it surprised me how young that is. It's about nine years old when I joined the swimming team. I love swimming, guys. And I... I hated the way I looked in, in a costume. It was my knees, it was my legs were too long, it was um, feeling that my tummy wasn't flat enough. As young as nine years old, when you are still a child, and I just remember every time having to put a costume on, whether it was swimming galas away, that fear that just gripped me, so much so that I actually stopped enjoying swimming. So I did it right up until my trick, but it wasn't an enjoyment for me. And Satan kind of robbed that of me. And I feel like, where did it come from? And I, and I look back and I go, mm-hmm. It was those very, what did I write here? Horrid creation. You know what it was? <laughs> Barbies? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Horrid creation, Barbie doll. And so I would picture myself, I wasn't Barbie. I wasn't looking like Barbie. And I swore to this day that I would never buy my child a Barbie because of that. And guess what? Gifts have brought Barbie into my own home. Those horrid creations are living in my house. <laughs> so I, have to, I had to go through all of those feelings. So have a look in your, in your life. When was that feeling of not feeling worthy enough or not good enough? And identify that moment and see how long it's, it's taken you and how far in your life. So those unrealistic pictures I had of what a woman should look like, what a girl should look like, kept me miserable. And Satan's le he kind of left me on my own because he knew that I was going to run with it right throughout my schooling years, right into my adult years, that I would have that insecurity, of those body awareness. Um, yeah, and then number two. So do you want to share what's your earliest memory of? My earliest would be um, my dad. Um, he passed away when I was nine years old. But before that, my dad was a very prominent rugby player. And um, I always felt that he had this expectation that as his son, I had to be this sportsman and this rugby player. And while he was alive, I just never wanted to do it because I never thought that I could live up to his expectation. And this is as young as nine years old. And when he did, yeah, yeah, yeah. And when he did pass away, um, I almost then wanted to now fulfill that expectation. And then I tried my hand at all these sports, and I tried to be this rugby player and tried to be, push myself to be something that I wasn't throughout my whole primary school career. And yeah, that's that's my first memory of an un, uh, unrealistic expectation. Nine, guys. Have yeah. a look. See if, let us know on the comment section how old your earliest memory is. See if it's younger than nine. Um, number two. Number two is expectations. Unrealistic ex expectations on others. It seems like it's a tongue twister yeah. tonight. Um, and I think a lot of the time is because of our upbringings, we get values that are instilled in us, morals that are instilled in us. 
um, and every family is different, so your value system is different. And because of those value systems, we can actually expect the same values from other people that are not necessarily going to be there. It's not a natural, it's not a given that everybody has the same morals, the same values. And so we, we don't work the same, we don't have the same work ethic, we don't have the same determination, we don't have the same dedication. And when we are expecting the same kind of morals, the same kind of values from other people, it is unrealistic and it's opening you up for disappointment or hurt. And so, for instance, the checkout tiller. So when, I am, when I'm going to checkers or pick and pay or wherever, I expect something from that checkout tiller that might be unrealistic in her eyes. So, don't chew chewing gum while you're talking to me. How can she be doing that? She's, she's talking to me chewing at the same time. Or, golly, she hasn't even said hello to me and she's chatting to her friend while she's serving me. How rude. And those kind of expectations for me, because I was born with in a family that saw that as unmannered, um, I placed on her where her value system might be, yay, she got through the day, she served so many customers, lots of them got their groceries and off they went, so I did a great job. So in her eyes, she might have done a great job. And in my eyes, it caused frustration and irritation because I'm going, golly, that was really bad service. And so that might be something at the checkout till as easy as that. On our children, the expectations we place on our children, we always, and then, yes, guys, I'm not saying don't have expectations for your children because we need them to be decent human beings. We need decent, loving human beings in this world that we're living in. But we sometimes expect them to always listen, to always be quiet, to respond first time. We ask them to do things like that, like almost to be unrealistically perfect. And when you look at it as an adult and you think of yourself, you can't even match those expectations you might have on your child. And so it's good to have a look and say, hang on, like, could I achieve that? Could I be that person in this moment, expecting my child to just sit still very quietly in this moment? Would I be able to do that? And sometimes it just opens our eyes, whether it's realistic or it's an expectation that you would want for yourself and yet you know you can't achieve. And then another one a lot of us place on our kids is unfulfilled dreams of sports maybe, um, and you mentioned it, like maybe you were going to be an amazing rugby player and something happened to your knee and now you never reached the goal of essays or something like that. And now your, your up and coming son is looking like he's got some kind of talent and so you're kind of directing him in the direction that you would want him to go. Is that unrealistic? Are you pushing him? Are you venturing him towards something that's not naturally for him? And are we expecting them to do something that we would have wanted them to do, um, uh, us as uh, when we were growing up? And then your boss. Golly, this is a hard one because we often feel justified in, in what we are, like promotion. We yeah. all feel like we put in that extra work and our boss surely can see that and they're going to naturally reward you on that. And it's not, yes, in an ideal world, that would be great your boss saw you and doing so many extra hours so many extra things and then just gave you extra money at the month that would be amazing but if you don't you're opening yourself up to disappointment and sometimes even bitterness that's stirring in your heart because now how dare she not see it how dare he not see it and I put in all this effort mm. Gardener, I mean, oh, we had this yeah. experience right, like, recently. We have built a relationship with our gardener, and we thought, like now, we've built this relationship that he would have the same respect for our property as if it was his own. We would expect that he would be loyal to us because we've been together for so many years. Only three lawnmowers and two <laughs> weed eaters later. <laughs> and it's not because they were poor quality, it's maybe because we just mowed right over them. Yeah. And so those kind of things, because we were like, how can he treat our stuff like this? It opened us up to that disappointment and that, that festers, guys. All of that disappointment, hurt, um, discouragement, that starts to fester in mm -hmm. our hearts. 
then we move on to point number three, our marriage. Now, when we were getting, we, we decided to get married because he just loved me so much, couldn't let me go. We went to pre <laughs> <laughs> pre-marital counseling. Yeah, let's backtrack there. Um, pre-marital counseling, and we had to do the six weeks. And the, and the pastor and his wife that, that counseled us, they made sure that there was no stone uncovered and turned upside down, and they made sure we knew what we were getting ourselves into. And so the one thing that, that came up quite heavily was my picture of my father. A lot of my expectations as a girl going into a marriage was a lot of those expectations, my dad's maybe shortcomings as well as his strengths are placed on my husband. You won't be this and you will be this because of that. So one thing I remember is we went to a wedding, my cousin's wedding, and um, at that time my dad was quite a heavy drinker. And um, I didn't even know that this was in me. And, and Jake had selected the welcome sherry instead of the welcome orange juice. And we weren't even standing wow. close together. And I was behind and I saw him pick up this glass. And that fire that burned inside of me, like how dare him touch alcohol? Does he not know? And that fire that burned inside of me, when it was brought up by the, the pastor, I could identify going, yes, I actually saw that in me, you know, yeah. like that is a problem. I had expected Jake's to be totally against it because of what I had gone through. And then on the other side is my dad was such an awesome handyman. He could do anything. If there was a pipe burst, he knew how to fix it. If, I don't know, the, the wall was cracked, he knew exactly where to go, what to do. And so I had this expectation that this is what a man does. And here, yeah, I'm marrying a man whose father passed away when he was nine years old. He had no experience with any kind of handyman stuff, never mind a drill. Jake, you didn't even know how to hold a drill. Hey, right? I figured it out. Now, there's, so later. There's Google and YouTube. <laughs> where, where there's a will, there's a way. Yeah. And then Jake started learning later on from my dad, which was so precious to watch him just wanting to learn these things. And funny, it was very funny because my dad really did take. <laughs> take advantage of the fact that he was willing and he made Jake's do very very hard all the dirty work and so it was very entertaining to watch needless to say I can now replace my own plumbing he knows exactly how to fix the, the pipes yeah. and, the, and the drills and everything yeah. like that but that expectation that I had on him I didn't even know was inside of me until they, they pinpointed it and I realized sure I would have then been so disappointed in Jake's when he couldn't hang up a, a picture frame because of the fact that I was just thought it was naturally in every man. Okay, right, let me just say it wasn't that bad. <laughs> I could hang up a picture frame, I could handle a draw and a hammer. No, you learned that later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we won't go there. But marriage, guys, is not a romantic novel. Yeah. It is not a love story from somebody's imagination. And when life gets tough, you have not failed in the true love story. That is not what, and that's what we're made to feel. We're mm. made to feel like if our love story doesn't end like the notebook, where he's loved me all this time and when I lose my memory, he's going to teach me to love him every day. That is not how, how it's always going to turn out. And when we get stuck and we move through that stuck stage, that's love. Love is seeing the really ugly side of your partner. Love is seeing that that hard side and working through it together, that is love, that is real love. Mm. Um, are we able to, are we expecting our partners to magically know what we're feeling? Are we asking our partners to, to be every part of our expectation instead of changing our expectations to meet our partners? Are we, are we expecting stuff from them, the butterflies maybe, never to go away, actually? The butterflies do go away. I had it for a very long time. I think seven years. I was still like, every time I saw Jake's, the butterflies were there. It does disappear. But even yesterday, I actually, there was a moment where he was talking to my family member and I just saw him. And I, did you see me grinning? Mm, that I was did. my butterflies. Yeah. I, I saw him and I actually went, there were butterflies. And God will bless that because we've gone through the ugly. We've really gone through ugly moments we with have. each other. He's seen side of me that is not pretty. And that's the, the real thing. Not, not this picture perfect um, movie love story. And then guys, point number four, expectations on God. So I have been reading the book of Joshua. Golly, 
if you guys love action movies and you love guts and gory, you have to go and read through the book of Joshua. It literally reminded me of the series in Netflix, um, The Vikings. Yeah. It's literally like they're taking over the city and there's guts and they, they slaughtered so many thousands and it's hectic. So anyway, so God was speaking to me through, uh, actually I realized our God is not a God of flowers and roses. He's not only a God of flowers and roses and puppies and kittens. Mm. He is a Sugar fierce God. He is a fierce God who's jealous for us. Mm. And I just love that, to see that side, because I think sometimes we just think God is just beautifully kind and everything. God is jealous for us, and He is a fierce God. Mm. So I, I just love that. So let me just paint you a picture. So um, Joshua was taking God's people, the Israelites, um, to go claim the, the promised land. And so they literally were taking over cities and conquering them and it really is like a movie it was mm. quite, it's quite nice if you have an imagination you'll hear the gunshots and everything even though there were no guns but anyway so <laughs> so they get to jericho and so now god has said to them once you've conquered this land jericho all the devoted items which is the gold and the silver and that i want you to collect all of them and i want you to give it into the lord's um, treasury so i don't want you to keep it it must go into the Lord's treasury and then burn everything else. So everything happened and then they were going to go to the next, the next city, which was I. I think it's pronounced like it. It's just A-I. I. I. Yeah. So then they were going to I. So they sent two, two spies out into, to go and have a look how many people there are, how many men, and, and so they could be prepared for the battle. And so they sent, the guys came back and said, oh, don't worry, there's not a lot of people there. Um, 2,000 or 3,000 men will be fine. Don't bother with the rest of the army. And so they sent 2,000, 3,000 men to the battle, and they saw them coming, and they literally ended up wiping all 3,000 men out. So Joshua was devastated because he knew that God was going to lead them to victory in each city. And so he came and he tore his robes and he just cried before the Lord and said, why did you bring us into the promised land to just let our enemies take us out? And God said, because they sinned. You're, the Israelites, my people, have sinned against me. They've lied, they've stolen, they've taken some of those devoted items, items and they've kept it amongst their own belongings. And um, until you have sorted that out, I'm not going to be with you. And so Joshua had to handle that. And I just thought the cheek of the Israelites, that God had done so many miracles right in front of them, guys, that he parted the Jordan River and he did such big miracles for them. Yet they thought that God will still keep his side of the bargain if uh, they, they were compromising and they were sinning. And then I just thought, no, it's not a cheek. It's what we do. Hmm. We sometimes think that God's side of the, the he will bless us even though we tick box. We tick box, I served in the church and uh, I've, I'm a good person and I give to the poor. And But now I am living a compromised life and sometimes I go and get drunk with my friends or sometimes I go and I um, compromise on what the, the will that God has for my life. And God is a fierce God, guys. He does not like that, but he fights for us. God wants us to have a prosperous life. God wants us to be blessed. He wants us to give us all the gifts, everything that our hearts desire, but we have to follow him wholeheartedly. And he doesn't like that compromise. And so um, reading Joshua and just thinking on how we can sometimes put such unrealistic expectations on God like that. Lord, I'm going to do this but you must still bless me so much. And don't cry out to the Lord if you're not paying your tithe. And then you're asking him, like, Lord, where's my finances? Why am I struggling? If you're not bringing your side of the promise, God's going to, he's not going to move. He's still going to be there. But he wants you to sort out all the nonsense in your life first. And so we kind of have to retrain our brain. Don't you love that? Mm. Retrain your brain. I'm very much teaching rhymes in my class at the mm. moment, and I love that. Retrain your brain, guys, because we are brainwashed into thinking that expe these expectations that we have in our life is fine. It's not fine. It's unrealistic, and it causes us to sin. It festers in our hearts. And so we need to drop those expectations. Or is expectations, the word expectations, even the right word? Well, let's have a look at that, guys. So, how do we then actually live a life that is 
free of expectation and free of disappointment and the pressure that others put on us and the world puts on us that ultimately leaves us feeling anxious and discouraged and allows resentment and all that kind of bad stuff to creep in. Firstly, guys, we need to surrender it completely and wholly to God. And in doing that, what we do is we shift our focus to replacing expectations with hope. That is the word, hope. <coughs> now, you're probably thinking, okay, well, hope is just wishful thinking. It's just a wish. It's just something, oh, I hope something's going to happen, or I hope something's going to go right. But that's what it is in today's culture. And the term hope is very, very loosely expressed as a wishful desire in the kind of world that we live in today. But the Bible defines hope as something completely different. And it's the way that God actually intended it. In the Old Testament, there's a verb that, um, for hope. Uh, it's called kava. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> um, and then there's a noun, which is tikva. And they both mean to trust and wait expectantly. So in the Bible, hope is a confident expectation, which is then rooted in God and His promises. John Piper puts it this way. He says, Christian hope is a confidence that something will come to pass because God has promised it will come to pass. So when we align ourselves with God and His promises and His will for our lives, it will come to pass. And we can all attest to the fact that expectation mostly leads to repeated setbacks, while hope, on the other hand, allows us to navigate those disappointments without losing any ground. And when we replace expectation with hope, we open ourselves to humility. Expectations rooted in pride, hope is rooted in humility. Where expectations are rigid, Hope is flexible. Where expectations are unforgiving, hope is forgiving. Expectation is fragile, but hope is resilient. And alongside faith and love, hope is actually one of the most important virtues that we can have as Christians. In Corinthians, Paul talks about love and he says, love hopes all things. He doesn't say love expects all things says love hopes all things and if you truly want to love somebody then you'll love them without expectation so how do we identify hope in our lives and how do we identify what hope is so hope is always in the future it's never seen but it's also never lost and in romans 8 24 to 25 it says for in this hope we were saved now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. See, hope requires us to wholeheartedly trust God. We don't see what we are waiting for, nor do we know when it will come and what it's actually going to look like. But through our trust in God, we become confident that it will come, and we wait patiently for those promises. Hope, well, our perseverance in our suffering brings about hope. Romans 5, 3 to 4. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So guys, trials develop our endurance, and they teach us to trust deeper and to trust God despite our sufferings. And that perseverance, what it will do is it will build your character and it enables us to see beyond those current circumstances and into the future that God has promised us, which then produces hope. Hope brings about joy and it brings about peace. Proverbs 10, 28. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. So hope produces joy because you know that a favorable event will happen and your wait is not in vain. See guys, this all, all of these things realign and it pushes us to realign our mindset and our lives with God 
and with his will for, his, for, for our lives. There is confidence in hope. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. See, hope is the fuel for our faith, guys. It produces that assurance that is the catalyst for faith. And another one, true hope only and will only ever come from God. Romans 15, 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And then hope endures. And that comes from Proverbs 23, 18. Do not let your heart envy sinners, but always be zealous for the fear of the Lord. There is surely a future hope for you, and your hope will not be cut off. See, God has purpose and promises for us. And they are internal. So I want to look at some practical examples of where we might have expectation and how we can shift that into hope. So somebody that might be struggling with sickness and a terminal illness or something, they, they will say, I might be healed by the sickness. If you look at it from a perspective of hope, with the grace of God, I will be strengthened through this sickness. My spouse never understands me because they don't meet my expectations. Looking at it through the lens of hope, my spouse is God's gift to me. Mm, say that one again. My spouse is God's <laughs> gift to me. My children might score better next time or they might do better in their exams next time. Looking at it through a lens of hope, God, and only God, will provide what is necessary for my children because He knows what they need and He knows what His promises are for them. This month I'm going to get an increase. A salary hike. <laughs> Through the lens of hope, God's grace is sufficient for me. I don't expect that salary increase. See, when we hope in God, we have expectations because God is reliable. He loves us and his faithfulness endures forever. He will never fail us because we fail to see the bigger picture. And our minds will never understand that God is doing things in our lives and doing things on our behalf that we don't even see. So instead of seeking to know it all, the more we seek to know God, the more at peace we become with, with those things that are unknown because we actually know Jesus. So it's because of who we know. So what I'd like to implore is that we lose our expectations and our man-made um, selfish desires and we shift that to a perspective and a mindset of hope that is rooted in God, in our relationship with God, in the Word of God, and in his promises that he has for our lives, for our marriages, for our careers, for our children, and for other people that we interact with. Because then what happens is our mindset completely changes and our expectations fall away and we have a lot more, there's a lot more room uh, for compassion and there's a lot more room to love the way that God intended us to love. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, we just thank you for your grace and your mercy, first of all, Lord. And Lord, we thank you that you love us so dearly, Lord. Lord, we thank you that you have given us this hope, Lord, this expectation, Lord, this, this confidence in the expectation of you fulfilling your promises in our lives, no matter what that may be, no matter what every person is going through, Lord, or what, no matter what their desires are, Lord, you have a will for them and you have a purpose for them, Lord. Mm -hmm. And whatever that is, Lord, we have a, a confident expectation, mm -hmm. a hope that you will fulfill that in our lives and in anybody else's lives, Lord. And Lord, we just thank you for loving us the way that you do, Lord. 
even through our insecurities and even through those, those unrealistic expectations that we place on our lives and on other people, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, we miss so much of who you, who you are and we miss so much of what you have in store for us because we put those man-made expectations in place mm -hmm. that limit us, that limit other people, that limit our relationships, that limit you at the end of the day. And Lord, we want to approach your throne room. We want to approach you with that sense of hope, with the lens of hope and not the lens of expectation. We want to know confidently that and approach our lives confidently that you are going to fulfill your promises in our lives. Mm -hmm. And we thank you for those promises, Lord. We thank you that each individual on this earth, Lord, that you have a purpose and you know the desires of their hearts when they are aligned and aligned with you and your will. You know those desires and you will bring them to fruition. So we lay down our past lives. We lay down everything that we have known and we have known to be. And we come with our hearts abandoned and open to your will and your promises. Mm, Lord Jesus, I just pray for all the people that are listening, Lord Jesus, that you would show them, highlight those moments from the past, Lord Jesus, that have caused destruction, um, absolute breakdown in their, their self-worth and their identity in who they're supposed to be in Christ. And I pray, Lord Jesus, right now that you would help them to identify it, name it, and I I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help them let go of that. And that from today, that they would start believing who you have designed them to be. That you would, Lord Jesus, take them from strength to strength. That you, Lord Jesus, would just embed in their hearts that, and in their brains, Lord Jesus, that you would re-trigger re every single thing that Satan has stolen from them. That you would re-root in them the, the love that you have for them the hope that you have for them, the absolute perfect design that you have for their lives, Lord Jesus. And I just pray that you would give them that sense of absolute self-worth, that they are who they are in Christ because you have made them a new creation. And I pray that all that hurt, all the, the doubt, all the self-absolute loathing, Lord Jesus, in every area of their lives, Lord Jesus, when they look in the mirror, Lord God, may they not see through the old lenses, but they will see through the new lenses. That they would see themselves as a new creation, wonderfully made, beautifully created by the Father who loves them. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would take them and grow them so much so that they would be a blessing to others. And every area of their lives that has been robbed, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would just start bearing fruit, allowing those trees and seeds to grow and that their lives will start bearing fruit in those areas, Lord Jesus, where Satan's come to steal and rob and destroy. You would just show that your love can grow at an absolute field, Lord Jesus, of gifting and absolute peace that you can give them in those areas. And Lord God, I pray that those areas that have been dormant, Lord Jesus, or absolute unfertile soil that you would start to to grow them in those areas so much so that they can use it in ministry Lord Jesus that they can testify that you have taken them out of that barrenness and you have brought them into a fruitful field of love and absolute acceptance in Jesus I pray Lord God that you would just start just throw every area every thought in our minds that you would start to sift through and bring to light the areas that we need to highlight in our lives as sin that has caused us to sin, that the hurts, that the disappointment, that the, the um, discouragement, Lord Jesus, will just be wiped away and that you would start to minister to those areas and bring healing in every one of those areas in Jesus' name. Amen. While we were praying, I just saw this, um, this vision of a child but this child is like it's like the poster boy of a child so so like you would see on an advert and beautiful blonde hair and blue eyes and this child's joyful but the child's running through this house and 
the father is chasing this child and but the father so from the child's perspective the child is playing this game and he's running away from the father and like 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 hide and seek and on the father's perspective the father just wants the child to stop so that he can actually hold the child and give it give his child a hug and just love his child and what i want you guys to know is that god is constantly pursuing you constantly pursuing you all we need to do is stop and let him take hold of us hold us love us and our lives will be completely different so that's us for today guys hope you guys enjoyed our online service um, if you want to connect with us uh, connect with us on the social media networks I think um, all the little tags have, have appeared on the screen um, if you need to chat if you need prayer if you need to contact us please do we're here for you um, we want to share God with the world out there and if you need anything please let us know and um, yeah that's us from Encourage thank you guys Well, can I just say, well done, Team Van Amerwe. Come on, guys. <laughs> what a message. That is so good to see how God is working in their lives. And man, we've just had such a privilege of walking this journey with them and just seeing how God is really igniting them as a family and, and what God's doing in their marriage. And uh, man, I can remember times when things were tough and all of us were tough and God is just using all of us and during this time and this this platform is so amazing and uh, I just want to encourage you guys man if you have not met Jesus if you've not met the Father now is the time to do so because I can tell you if you connect with Jesus your life instantaneously receives purpose and I and, I, and I've got the sense and while I'm standing here and I was I was playing in the background. I just had this song come up in my, in my spirit. And I believe there's some people that need to hear this. And I, and I believe it's something from the Father's heart. And if, if He could sing a song to you right now, and I, I believe it would go something like this. My child, you my you child. You are my beloved, and I chose you, and I love you with everything I have. <laughs> my child, you are my beloved, my child, you're all I ever wanted. And I've told you Cause I want you For myself oh. <laughs> And I have seen myself So take your place And I have seen myself so I can save your face <laughs> You are my beloved <laughs> And you are my beloved And you are my beloved <laughs> Thank you Father And if you're sitting here tonight and you have never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, <laughs> I want to encourage you, tonight is a night that you can make the best decision of your life. If that is you, pray after me. Come on. Father God, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that I have messed up. But I know that you're a God of a second chance. And so, Father God, I, I want to invite you into my life. 
and I declare you Lord and Savior of my life. Come inside and reign. Make my body your dwelling place. In Jesus' name. You are my beloved. you pray that prayer welcome to the biggest family you've ever experienced in your life and if you did pray that prayer we would love to hear from you like to connect with you and our details should be on the screen right now and uh, if you want to reach out or if you've got a question if you want to connect don't hesitate to reach out touch base with us check our social media pages share the love and put Jesus first. Amen. And if you want to give, that's also cool. You can give. <laughs> Details should be on the screen now as well. Have a good week, guys. God bless. Goodbye.